The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. I can hear her heartbeat from a thousand miles. You ever hear one's open? You ever tap she smiles? And when I come to her, that's where I belong. So join your channel. Hi guys, welcome to Cosmopolitans with Lauren. It is ladies night tonight, right? It's a new lineup, I think. And lo and behold, I'm keeping it together after we have had a problem with the communication with our uh, guest tonight. But anyway, let's go over a few things. Um, I haven't been here in a week and I'm hoping that all of y'all have had got your ingredients together. And you're ready to have your say. You are trying to read accepting calls at this time. There we go. You're having your snake um, drinks proper. And I actually got Tess over the pond today. Um, so I'm really excited because if we didn't have Tess today, we'd be freaking out because we can't get a phone call in to our guest tonight. All right, so Tess, how are you today? I'm great, love. How are you? Um, so, Tess, um, I wanted to say, first of all, <laughs> I wish that we had a, it's everything right there. It's right here. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry, guys. I'm sorry, people. It is really hard to sometimes be on the show because people wait. I, I, I wait to the last minute. Guests wait to the last minute, and, and we're here. All right. So I had, if y'all looked at my live feed today, y'all saw where um, I was crazy uh, having sh injections in my back. So we're going to give me a pass today because. Yeah, because it's, you've been stoned all day. It wasn't all day, but you, you saw what I went through, right? Oh, I saw it on your life. I mean, yeah. Facebook, yeah. So people, the the point of my story of putting that up is, I know some of the people were like, ooh, why is she putting that up? The reason I put that up is because you have to address injuries when you get them. So, so okay, so the fun story so that I have. So injuries is fun. Yeah, we have, we don't have mental injuries. Um, we have a fun story to tell. Hey, Tess, what yeah. about when I came in and asked you to join my pool party because... Um, the One Direction girlfriends. Well, see, you know, you would think I have more connections with them than I do you. Because I'm from, actually from Manchester. Right. England. So, you know, I'm more closer to them than you are. Well, we have to explain the One Direction band, which you got Stop, on the air. Don't, no, you started please. crying about and sobbing about while I was don't, talking about. I don't want to talk about um, it. Well, ladies of London, but I was sitting out by the pool, and one of the girls there, his best friend was, who was her best Danielle. friend? Danielle, now she, Danielle, <clears throat> let me, sorry, um, Louis Tomlinson, love lad, he had a son, uh, he had had a past girlfriend on, John? Okay, all right, tell, real quick, real quick. Uh, no, uh, he had a past girlfriend, Eleanor, and Danielle, and Danielle was his girlfriend, and then he had a fling with a girl, and he had a baby with her, and that, then he was back with Danielle, and then he went to um, Eleanor again. So. Okay, well, my point in my story is that the girl was getting hate mail, and I just said, why does she even read right, hate mail? love. Why does she even read hate mail? I would never read hate mail. That's the thing, people. If there's something out there negative on your Facebook page or your web page or anything like that, don't read it. Like, you just have to scan over that stuff because you have to think that that person is just sitting behind their computer. They have nothing to do but grouch all day. It's like, I always consider it. It's like, are, are we, am I still continuing? Okay. It's kind of like Sesame Street. I don't know. I know we have a lot of people in Rome and France and stuff. So, it's ringing. So we don't know. I mean, I don't know if you have Sesame Street there, but Oscar at Sesame Street is like a grumpy person. So um, are you there, Jerry? I sure am, Lauren. Hey, Jerry. Okay, Jesus, God Almighty. I think that people, like, stand by and, like, want to <laughs> smoke a doobie before my show. <laughs> And this is so stressful. My producer has to go because he has another job, and he was like, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. 
tell the assistant producer to walk in here, could you please, and start filming? How are you? <laughs> How are you? All right, now, Jerry, I have to set the scene. Um, all right, we're setting the scene because you're the author, all right? We had all these injections in our back. I'm driving home, and I'm like, I can taste the medicine that they put in my neck. And then my producer got stuck on another job. Hey, lock the door, please, behind him. Lock the door. And then we start trying to call Jerry, and we can't get through. We're Skyping him, but we're calling him, but we're Skyping him, but we can't get through. And it is a nervous situation, and I'm able to carry it off, I hope so. Jerry, are you going to help me? Yeah, I hope you, uh, like, drank a lot or did, like, some amphetamines so you can talk me through this. I'm going to I'm gonna talk you through this one. Don't you worry. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, and my producers can't burp during the show because that makes it more upsetting to me. All right. So we're explaining why we had a hiccup the first five minutes, and I was having to, like, go uh, on – brain fluid all right jerry we've already posted up all your successes and i noticed that your um book has four stars on amazon which is quite thrilling right it sure is like how do you how do you feel like that that's like your first time author you know it's it's a great affirmation something that all authors really are thrilled when their readers post such great reviews i've gotten mostly five star reviews um, so it's, it really, uh, it, it takes you right to the moon. It's fantastic. Um, and how did, how did you come about with your storyline? And first of all, I'm going to let you introduce yourself the way you want to be introduced right now. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's always great to be on your show, Lauren. Uh, my name is Gerald Lerner, and I'm the author of The Nighthawk Deception. It's an action thriller. Uh, that's available on uh, Amazon and iBooks and Barnes and Noble, all your favorite retailers. Oh yeah, we love that. We love Barnes and Noble. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so the uh, storyline, uh, I came across it. You know, ever since I was a little boy, I was always a reader. I always had a book in my hand, and this particular genre, action thriller, suspense, that was me. I was always reading. It could be a Robin Cook or Stephen King or Robert Ledman, what have you, and I just loved it. So to find myself uh, writing about this one day was really a natural progression. Uh, it was very comfortable to get into that uh, mindset. So I found myself, uh, while I'm, I was living in New York, I live in Los Angeles now, uh, and I had a photo studio uh, working in Tribeca. And while I wasn't shooting, I found myself writing more and more and more and just getting more excited and drawn into this story. And the characters really just uh, came alive. It was very exciting. I, and tell me about your characters. Well, you have a, um, a very exciting group of people that uh, are uh, ex-CIA, Army Rangers, Secret Service. And they've been employed by the CIA director to go after and rescue uh, a brilliant Russian scientist family and him from a biogenetic company that's trying to get his discoveries, fantastic discoveries mankind's been after for millennia. And in doing so, the CIA director wanted these discoveries for the United States and to rescue the family. And that's when the adventure really starts. Very exciting for those of your listeners who enjoy uh, car chases and gunfights and drones and international intrigue and traveling uh, over Europe and evading Russian mercenaries. This is the book. So it's like a born ultimatum. Yes, it <laughs> is. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so I, am I going to be the writer on your movie? I think I think we're, we have something here. I feel chemistry. I do too. Well, we always do because we talk about what we're going to do for the. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry and I compare what we're going to do for exercises, and now that he lives in Los Angeles, I'm like, you need to go here and you need to go there. And, and did you go where I told you to go? Have you gone any? I haven't yet, but it is on top it's of my on list. On your top of your list. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll explore that together. 
Um, they're having to make me hot tea if y'all hear water, running water in the background. Um, and so, yes, and so he's a major athletic person, and I kind of flayed off on the subject on that. But what took you from Los Angeles from New York? Was it your book? You know, it was all, I, I, uh, California always resonated with me. I, I don't know. It's just, you know, certain people uh, have a little itch. And sometimes you need to travel and, and you find different places that speak to you in a different way. Uh, New York City is uh, fantastic, exciting. I was there for 10 years in Tribeca. Um, but, you know, it comes a time where uh, you don't want to deal with uh, those long winters in the city and uh, having to jump on the train during the summertime at 120 degrees down there. With the rats. Yeah, yeah. it's just so beautiful out here. I, I can't wait for your visit. We're, we're I'm going to take on some great hikes. Um, it's it's really good living here. I, I, love, I love it. I, I'm telling you, I can't remember. I'm going to have to uh, tell you. Like This is almost like we really are sitting down having a cup of coffee because I feel like I know Jerry, <laughs> and we're off track. But I'm going to tell you, uh, one of the guys that I used to train with at one of the gyms, and I can't say it on the air, but it's Albert Beckles. He trained Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's this small gym in the valley. Um, it's a great gym. It's not like one of those superficial gyms. That's why I got all those shots today. It's not a superficial gym. It's like a real gym for real people that are training and not trying to go look cute and jump around and have their boobies bouncing up and down and their ponytail it's, swinging. It's like it's a real a whole gym. It's a different world. The fitness world out here. I thought I was in shape in New York until I came out here. It's, um, it's just, well, you can work out 365 days a year. Yes. And the part I loved about living in, in California so much and living, I lived on the beach in Santa Monica, was that like after work, because, you know, a lot of the work is in the valley. And, and you know, at the studios is in, you know, in Beverly Hills or whatever. But it was like such a long commute. But as soon as you hit over there and saw the ocean, and then you walk down on the beach and you can ride your bike or you can run. And then you've got the, you know, the little gym things on the beach set up for you that you can work right. out. It, it's, it was just like, okay, well, I don't really matter that I was in the car for two and a half hours. I feel okay about it. But I steer off track because I love California. All right, <laughs> so now you were a photographer before this. There's so many people that write me because, guys, I will tell you that I'm a screenwriter. I'm not an author. I'm trying to write right now. I think it is one of the hardest jobs ever because trying to form sentences to be complete sentences and, you know, and not have a run on sentence is a huge thing. Were you, did you take writing classes or was that your major or does it just come naturally to you? Well, that's that's a really good question, Lauren. And, and believe it or not, and uh, and and um, I want to encourage your listeners to, to do the same. I uh, I ran a very successful uh, photography, fashion, commercial business down in New York. And uh, one day, I just sat down. I always wanted to be an author. I always wanted to try, and I just sat down and I started writing. I didn't know really what I was doing at first. Uh, but it really all just started to come together and it gelled. And uh, you just, if you're persistent enough and if you focus enough and you work at it long enough, it'll come to you. Uh, I never took a class. I never, did, no, I never did you my write? Major. Did you Did you write in high school? I mean, was that something, did you journal or something like that? Because... I, 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 I just, I'm just going to tell you straight out, I never wrote a thing. You are Ever. crazy wild, right? I, That's I crazy just, uh, that you're out of the gate with such a great book. I just wanted to do it. That's how I was raised. You know, I think my mom and dad did a pretty good job. And they taught me when you want to get something, you do it right. You do it right the first time because they always made me do it again. <laughs> That's not so, great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, so, I so, you know, it, it came to me. It's, it's, it's really a wonderful story. I'm very proud of it. I know your listeners would really love it. It's a great song to read. Um, there's, it, there's even some buzz going around. I've, I've mentioned it, and I don't want to get the, put the car before the horse, but I have presented it to some people in the film industry already, uh, possibly for adaptation. Uh, so, uh, I could have helped you with that. 
Well, you're still on board. You're well, no, I could have helped you with people to present it to. You're my go-to girl. You know that. <laughs> I'll give you somebody to give it to. I will be honest, I have not read that because I have like 50 books on there. But I read um, about it and um, I read the reviews on it. And it sounded amazing. And I think that's like, uh, it would have been, we should have had you on before Father's Day. That would have been a great Father's Day present. Because, oh, you know, yeah. uh, should, uh, one of my best friends, Sydney Fisher, who's a, a, a ghost writer and stuff, she always does these Facebook things with her uh, covers of her books and kind of what it's about. And she does it before Father's Day. And then she'll wrap it up for Christmas and stuff like that. It, it they've done really well on Amazon. Just FYI, people that are out there, because for some reason people think that I write book books and I don't. I write screenplays because I have grammatical issues. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> complete sentences. I'm from the South and um, I'm shut down a lot of times. I don't form complete sentences, but I like expressive. I'm very expressive. So like when you're writing a screenplay, you can do like, you know. Not that I would ever say ain't none, but you could put ain't none that anything. It, it doesn't have to be grammatically perfect. Now, as a writer for a book, I've seen two different versions. I've seen a version where people write where it's really just a pretty beautiful sentence and it just kind of goes into fluidly what they're writing. And I've seen people that are anally retentive about it being grammatically correct. Where are you in the spectrum? <laughs> Another great question, Lauren. Uh, I'm somewhere um, in the first category, but I have to, I, I, when I present my work to my editor, I often get spanked and I am corrected. Uh, we battle over it and uh, sometimes I win, sometimes they win. It's pretty proper. It's pretty, pretty straight on. I, uh, they, they don't like me to use a lot of the accents that I would like to use, mm -hmm. which I think adds a lot of color like you. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take you to write a book? From beginning to end, uh, it was about a two-year process. And that includes, you know, having it edited, working with your book cover designer, um, getting it uh, online, the whole, everything, two years. And how much time, I'm asking these questions because I get so many people that are like, send me stuff. And I'm like, Ooh, don't send it to me. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you to do that. Um, if I do know how to tell you where to go, I will tell you. But um, how long, like, because you were a photographer at the time. And I have another friend, Mike, that wrote a book while he was working at the time. So was this like a venture that you uh came upon on the weekends or like when you got home from work or your spare time or was it something like for me when I write I sit down and I'll sit there for three days straight writing 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 and then I get up um, other people write for a little bit and then they get up and move and you know come back to it how did you for a two-year process what was it was it was a mix. It was a mix. Uh, when I wasn't shooting, I would uh, be writing. So a lot of that writing took place uh, late in the evening. Uh, the best way to write, and for your listeners who are interested in this, it's r the more time you can spend consistently writing every day, as long as you can, the better the quality of the product will be. There's no doubt. So the longer you can give to it, the better it becomes. Um, there'll be times where you can't pick it up for a day or two because you're you're so busy working, and you'll come back to it and say, "Okay, where was I?" And you find yourself rereading a few chapters to get caught back up. And this is something that, uh, as a writer, people that are out there that want to be writers or screenplay writers or something, they're always looking for how to do this, how to yet. Now, did you use a dragon by chance? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. Okay, for I my do. listeners, let me tell y'all real quick. For a screenplay, you can get a final draft and it will line up everything in your scenes and stuff like this. Um, when I started writing my book, which I won't say, I haven't gotten to like one, one chapter, um, I learned that you could get a dragon and you could speak into it and it can, it, it can format it out so you're not hovered over a computer all day. Now, tell me what did you like the dragon, or did you not like the dragon? I never had the chance to order it. I looked into it, and I just got caught up in so many things. I've always wanted to try it. 
Well, I haven't tried it, but obviously my back doesn't do well on computer. <laughs> Y'all, I just can't sit over a computer all day. I don't know what the problem is. I've heard great things about it. I think it's a real viable option for anyone. Yeah, it's like people that uh, people that are out there listening. I mean, like uh, people, the advertisers and lawyers and people that get these bursts of ideas and they keep a, a tape recorder with them and they, you know, speak into the, the tape recorder and give that ideas. This is something that you can do as like, you just pick it up instead of typing, you're speaking your ideas, which would be great for me because I'm a speaker, although I didn't do very good. I didn't do very good at, uh, what is it? hobnobbing at the very beginning of the show I didn't do good spontaneously because I had my shots today anyway so all right so your book is we're going to call it the next born do you when you think about pitching this to a book because let's be honest every author and I because I have so many friends that are authors I mean I have a ton even my brother's an author every author envisions that their book it might be become a movie one day do you have you advanced your thoughts into that already of who you would like to play the parts in the movie? You know, um, it's funny you said that because I'm going to connect something we were just talking about a little earlier about fitness in the gym. There is one person, um, one of the um, evil Russian villain characters. I have the perfect guy for him, and he works. He works out at my gym. I see him all the time. Mickey Rourke. Rourke. Mickey Rourke would kill this. And he's got the Russian accent thing down because he's played that villain before. And then um, the gym that I'm going to send you to, you're going to see all the people that you want to see that you really don't see, but they really work out, but you just can't talk to them. Like somebody yeah. broached me one time to like do something, and I was like, you just don't talk at this gym. <laughs> everybody's there seriously where you're there to work out but you all have like existing careers and you can't and the only reason I was at that gym is because my children were going to the school for stars my daughter was working on a movie and I didn't want to leave them too far away so I worked out at the gym I mean I worked out for like four hours but it is amazing the characters and the connections that you build because I still have so many connections from working at the gym mm. um and, you know, okay, Jerry, we're, we're floating off of your topic of your book, and we'll come right back to it. But you and I being athletes, I really want to say that there is a, there's things that are called gyms, and then there's workout places. A gym, to me, is a place where you're going to really work out, and you're, you're devoted right. to your workout, and you're there to do that and then there's workout places where you go to be cute and bouncy and jump around and try and hit on people i've yeah, always been we, a gym we put our eggs down and we mm -hmm. work out and we work out and you know if you want to go to the fruit bar machine after your workout that's great um but you know even if you're going to a gym or a workout facility to me i think when you're at a gym and people are devoted and really intense people that are connecting with their workouts they're probably devoted to whatever they do if you're kind of just you know flying flying around and trying to get dates and stuff maybe you're not so intense and maybe you're not where i am in my level of i'm devoted to my workout i'm devoted to my work i'm devoted to what i need to do that's just you know there's a package deal there and it, i'm not so fly by night is isn't that crazy that i'm connecting the two I think I think it's perfect. We're we're two peas in a pod. I think exactly the same way. I I'm often afraid to uh, tell my friends how long I work out in the gym. They'll think I'm crazy. Um, you know, a lot of them will work out an hour and make that's wonderful. I'm there for I'm there two three hours. Can you I, listen? I wish my producers would throw the headphones on. I don't know if you saw <laughs> my video yeah. on today, but th when I was getting my blocks and. For in, in my thing, and they were like, well, can you just go without exercise? And I was like, no, I just, I can't. I can't do anything. But I find that it's, I will say this, with creative people, and I've been around creative people so much because I have an actress and a writer in the family and an entertainer in the family and then me, um, 
it's like it is a way to most people like that are ADD, ADHD, or they're really hyper focused on certain areas, and it's a way to calm their energy and get them focused. I can't really, the days that I don't work out, I don't perform great in my business 100%, life. 100%. 100%. Well, two peas in a pot, exactly. I'm the same way. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do three hours in the gym, and then I'll do a 20-mile bike ride. See, uh, I think I think we might have to get married, Jerry. What do you think? <laughs> this is a formal proposal both. on the air. I'm yeah. proposing to you. He would be my yeah. person, person, because he he likes the the to write and do stuff like that and work out. There's not a lot of people well, that like that. Well, today just turned into a great day for me. Though. Oh, you're so <laughs> sweet. I know we have to do because I, I was talking to him the other day and I was like, you have to go to Malibu Canyon. Um. It, it, oh yes, that yes. that's a beautiful. In fact, my daughter shot the movie um, Simon Says there. That's how I explored that. Now, was it a big jump to say you gave up uh, your career in in doing? But see, that's in saying this. I'm going to say people that are creative and write books and write movies and do artwork and do comic books and fashion world and stuff. So you've always kind of been in the entertainment business because you were a photographer. But that's a big jump to move all the way from New York, write your book, and then move to L.A. Was the move to L.A. in hopes to write your second book and then get it made into a movie? Or was it just, you know, just like, I'm retiring and I'm going to go move to L.A.? It was more of the latter, you know, of where, not that I am retiring, I'm not close, but, uh, you know, where would I want to put some roots down? And, you know, New York City is great. And it's fantastic, but uh, you know, really to put some roots down and just to to be in a healthy environment, uh, I don't think you can beat California. So it was a, just a chance to to finish the sequel. I am working on the, the sequel of the Nighthawk Deception is almost complete. Oh, crazy! Wow. Yeah. So, did um, you write that first book and leave it open for it to come for a second book? To come I around? certainly did. This you is, did. This, so you this, weren't just like. Oh yeah. Bam! 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 This is going to be a franchise just like The Born Identity. And Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes. This yes, is crazy. So let me ask you this. Another question is, did you, um, my, my daughter is in the midst of writing her book. And I will say that my daughter, okay, all right, this is a mama waves out, people. I'm going to mama wave out. But she, is an, she was an amazing actress, but she really wanted to turn to writing. And we have to say, all right, I'm going to say it on the air. You're kind of like Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it's kind of deep and dark and serious. Um, and she has won a bunch of competitions as she went around and traveled. So she's trying to combine all her stuff into one work. This isn't for her because I already got her packaged up a deal. But for those people that are right, that ask me questions, for someone that was a newly writer and, and trying to form, you know, start creating, I guess, your career in the middle of your mid-season of life, I guess. I mean, it's not like you were in your early 20s. How did you go about finding an editor and a designer for your book? I mean, people don't understand the process. They think, oh, well... You don't, I just go do this. I can just sell it on Amazon. I can just do this, that, and the other. It is so not easy, people, because everyone wants to be where he is. Everybody. There's, a, I, like, I'm so appreciative. I love you, Joe. My boss. Everyone wants to be where we are. And, and there are routes that you take, and then there's pure luck. What were the, what were the routes, and what was the luck? Well, uh, I can tell you that it was uh, not easy uh, because as someone like your listeners who want to be an author, uh, I didn't know what to do, who to call, who to contact, and it was really just through perseverance and putting my head down to figure it all out and a lot of use of Google uh, to find out you know, what a publicist is, uh, what a good book designer is. I got very lucky in finding my book designer. Um, I was actually, believe it or not, pretty intimidated calling him because I had found out he did books for Norman Mailer, Tom Brokaw, uh, oh, wow. and I just decided to go for the best I could. So you just so, called him out of the blue? Isn't that the worst thing ever? Out of the blue and turned out to be Andy Carpenter. I'm giving him a shout out in the city, in New York. Just a, just a brilliant, 
brilliant book designer, super nice guy, um, took me under his wing, told me he'd work with me on the project, loved the genre, loved my work, and so there's your luck. So there, I got lucky with that. Uh, I got lucky with Andy. Uh, you know, other than you know, trying to figure out how to publish it, and you're 100% right, Lauren. It is difficult, uh, and it takes a lot of perseverance. And you, you really need to do your homework, figure out what it is, and you take a bite of the apple every day, and eventually you get there. Um, so do you, do you think that, um, did you have any extra, like when you cold called the guy that did the, because I love the, the cover of your book, I think it's beautiful, um, that's like freaky hard, that's like for me, I have to look for sponsors and I can't stand it, I'd rather open my veins right here and bleed out for you <laughs> than have to cold call someone, I just cannot stand it, um. Did you have a way in, and that's what I'm saying. Like for your editor, did you did you have to send out your? Um... You have to send your work out to find an editor is very difficult. Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people out there who will call themselves editors. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of editors. Uh, there's not just one editor. I used two different editors who did two very different things. Really? Um, yes, for my book. So. You have line editors, you, you, you have all kinds of different editors, and the most important thing uh, is to talk to as many as possible, see what kind of clientele they've had. You can research the books that they've worked on. Uh, you can actually buy the books, download them, uh, and see if you like the work, which is what I did. I got very fortunate again, but it took literally months to find a good editor. A lot of the best editors you're going to find today are working for the biggest publishing houses, and they're not available to you. I was going to say, I, I should have said that. I'm going to give a big, I'm going to give a shout out to Randall Battenkopf that does my editing on my screenplays. Major person. Um, but I guess when I said editor, I should have said publisher. So how did you find your publisher? Because that's what I would think would be really hard. Very hard. So I went, I'm an indie publisher. I'll explain in a second what that means to your listeners. To find a, a, a publishing house to take you on is really a Herculean effort. Um, unless you know someone and you're connected to the literary world and you're going in from scratch, very hard. Uh, you typically will find yourself a literary agent. These are the people who discover you and like your work. You send your work in uh, along with hundreds and thousands of other people, literally. And your work is uh, uh, has to float to the top, like cream to the top. And then that literary agent will decide to work with you. It's their job at that point to submit your work to a variety of different publishing houses who will want your work or not. Then, once it's chosen, hopefully, uh, you then go into queue and you have to wait approximately about a year uh, for it to actually be published. So it's a bit of a process. That is a huge process because um, my daughter did a movie that I just talked to one of the producers. I mean, like, this is... The divorce day time, and he was like, "Oh, the movie's coming out this summer." She's gonna. She's like nine when she did that movie, and everybody thinks when you're on the other side of things that it is just. I guess I really want to relate to people because of the things that I get with people thinking that I can help them or connect them, and I really will, people, if I can, I will. But it it is such determination, and it takes a long time. And those success stories that you read about and the success stories that you see, you're seeing them because they are a one-in-a-thousand type deal. The other stuff just takes blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, it is just blood, sweat, and tears. Amen. It, you know, a lot of... I, you know, I, there's a lot of things I would like to do, people, but I don't get to do them because I am making a career for myself in a different industry, which a lot of people want to be in. Um, so 
when I'm in saying that, when it's, and I haven't, that's in fact, my producer gave me some grief today, and I can say this because he ran out. He had another job to go to. Um, but he was like, gosh, it's so funny. When I met you, you were writing all these movies. Now you've become so much more into entertainment. Yeah, I, I'm vacillating between each section of entertainment. So my question to you is, you have this book that you've started, you've got your first book out, and you've got the second book. Do you ever like lay down at bed at night and start thinking and go, hmm, I might want to try another different book in another direction or have an idea for another book, but you've got to categorize it? Lauren, you're so smart. I, you, you know me so well already. Um, I told yes. you, you're going to be my <laughs> husband, right? Oh, huh? I, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, I can tell you I have at least four books lined up oh, wow. that uh, I want to get to, and they have nothing to do with the uh, the Nighthawk Deception franchise. It's, it's a whole different uh, uh, set of genre, a whole different set of circumstances. Uh, love to get to it, but like you said, it's blood, sweat, and tears. There's only so many hours in the day. Uh, and, you know, we, we do as much as we can do, uh, and st we still have to go to the gym and work out. And we still do. All right, Jerry, I'm going to ask you a really important question, because as I said that about my daughter being like an Edgar Allan Poe, I find that authors are more deeply affected than I, because um, we pre-recorded a show for July 4th, because I'm probably not going to be on the air with y'all July 4th, not that I have plans, but... I think my whole station is shut down, but I do feel like authors and writers have a deeper sense of emotional range. Like it, even men can tap into a various emotions, whereas, um, say, my one of my soldier boys that I would be talking to to him, he's not able to tap into anything. It's kind of like you know, kind of raw and gritty, and that's his only emotion. I do feel like writers have to be able to tap into others' emotions and pick up feelings and emotions and empathy of others to be able to write about various, uh, from various, uh, what am I trying to, characters' views. I mean, you're not just writing on one character. You've got to, you know, put in a 100%, bunch of... 100%, 100%. Absolutely. You nailed it. You really have to be able to tell a story and, and emote and empathize uh, with male characters, female characters. You have to see uh, the, from their perspective and then weave that into the story. So you are, I have six, eight different characters all at the same time doing various things. Uh, and you have to juggle each scene of what's going on chapter to chapter, uh, it, it, you really do have to have, I don't want to say a gift of it, but a talent for it. I'll leave it at that. Did it open you up when you had, you said you had six or seven characters, female, male characters, did that open you up to feel, kind of look at like females differently or other people differently? Like I know for me it does. I, I'm just, I, this is, I, I really just did a 90 degree swerve around because I wanted to say this. Because me, I can imagine being in your spot when I wrote my first movie. I can remember it was during my divorce and I was, ooh, I was gross. And I went up to go film the first day and I was sitting on the set and all of a sudden the actors of what I had written about them, the actors that I had described in this very vividly of who they were and whatever, and what the producers and the directors chose to be was so not what I had envisioned. And so it was really, it, it times, there was maybe one actor that was, one wasn't. So it was really hard to me to, to feel my story when they were talking the part. I was like, you shouldn't be in that position. <laughs> do, do, do you, did you have a different view? Like when you wrote those characters, did you see people differently or... Well, you've already talked you, about you envisioning other pe people in your roles. You but. do. I think, I think every good author, writer, naturally has that skill set to begin with. Though, as you develop it and you start to write, you know, these very complex, multi-character 
uh, uh, adventure novels, uh, it definitely broadens you out. You definitely it, it, it deepens your skill sets. It allows you to see into people a lot more than you normally would. Yes, definitely. Now, has your family been supportive of you in your work? Is that very, too nosy? very supportive? I've been very fortunate and blessed. I have a wonderful family. I really do. So, because when you, I was thinking about from moving to New York to Los Angeles, did you have a uh, because you you moved at a crucial time. You moved when you started your book. Oh, please don't start barking, puppy. Um, I'm like Bravo. I have my little puppy in here. Um, I, when you moved from New York to LA, you moved in kind of a you know crucial time. You were leaving your career and you're starting this new book. Did you have a support group when you moved to LA, or did you just go like? you know, witness pr protection program thing where you don't know anybody. And you're a little just... of both, actually. <laughs> I think there were still some people back in the city I, I, that, that uh, I hadn't got around to letting know that I was leaving. Uh, I was fortunate. I did have some cousins who had moved out here several years earlier. Uh, we're very, very close family. They're more like brothers and sisters to me. Uh, and all their children are, are like my nieces and nephews. So... Uh, yes, I, I, I had uh, cousins that that lived about an that live about an hour from me, so that was comforting. Did is the entertainment thing running your does the entertainment gene run in your family? Like in my family, everybody except for whether you're an athlete, in my family, or you're an entertainer, there's just no in between in my family. Um, is, is did that that chromosome hit everybody? Uh, just the opposite, actually. I'm really? the black sheep. Uh, I am too. Just so you know, <laughs> I am literally the black sheep. People, but go uh, ahead. Yeah, no, we're 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 business people, professionals, um, and and I was a businessman, you know, for the first half of my life. We'll, we'll say it that way. Uh, but to go off on a creative, to be a creative, to be an artist, uh, I'm really the the you know other than. One other cousin of mine, she lives in San Francisco and is absolutely phenomenal. She's a woman's clothing designer. I'll talk to you about her off air. I think you'd look great in her clothing. Uh, um, Love very, that. And very couture. I'll be shooting her line, actually, in the next month. Um, well, I think that you need the face of me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's funny. It's because my family, my, my family started the first and the largest department store in the South. And it was this huge bedang. Everybody knows about it. I don't talk about it on the air. But fashion's just always been part of my, you know, thing. And today when I was going to the doctor, my, my daughter looked over at me. She goes, do we have to dress up for every event? <laughs> it's like, she was like, whether you're in gym clothes or you're dressed up. And I was like, yes. And that is because I do my gym activities for three or four hours. And then I get my dress up activities. But, um... I'm always into fashion, and it cracks me up because my daughter, like I said, it's the Edgar Allan Poe in her. She doesn't care. I mean, she's beautiful. She was a model. She's an actress, whatever. But jeans, no makeup, sweatshirt, that's it. That's all she's going to do. Um, and I, I just don't know where she came from because... <laughs> She's she, she's gonna be her mother's daughter. Don't yeah, well, worry. well, I she, that's what, she looks a lot like me. But even like today, when they were doing a thing, they were we were doing a live feed on um, sports injuries and how to treat them. And she was like, oh, "Well, luckily, being an athlete, skip that generation because it doesn't work out at all. I don't know how she does it, but she's an amazing writer. Like I said, well, um, I'll tell you, I'm gonna I'll give a a, a, a a quick shout out. My cousin is Giselle. Shepparton, that's her label. You look at her stuff. I'll hook you up. Oh my gosh, honey! I would. Oh, so okay, we're gonna have to talk tomorrow. Can't do it today because if, if you go, I want you to go to my Facebook today and Google. I look at everything I put up today and understand okay. why difficult, why why yeah, why today has been a stressful day. And then when my producer walked in late, and and I, I was like, oh, no. um, all right, so. We're really excited. So can you give us an idea? All right, so we've already finished the book. Did you put it up on Amazon? It's up on Books a Million. We can Kindle it. Um, yes. Because I, I tried to tried to put up, and I wish that I could, my, my producers let everything go through. I wish I could put up everything that you sent me, but some stuff wouldn't load up to go up onto my page. So when we're looking for the book, 
Um, if we walked into Books a Million, would we be able to find that book? Uh, it's ebook right now. Okay. You can find it online on Amazon, uh, iBook, Barnes and Noble, Goodreads. So you can go on Kindles, iPads, any device. Now, have you gotten your publicist so you can start doing book tours? I am in the process, and this is good for your listeners to, to hear as well, so I'm, I'm in the process of interviewing about three different publicists right now, and that's a very critical part of the next phase of publicizing your brand and building your book. Uh, and publicists are very different. They all have their specific niches. They're not all the same. It's a process. It is a difficult process. Now, sweetheart, I'm just asking these questions because th people want to know about you. So... You're looking for a publicist, which I can help I'm you. an open book, Lauren. You're an you open book. I know. If you're in the entertainment business, people, that's what I said the other day. So I zapped a picture of me, and I couldn't do anything about it, and I was more upset that I looked chunky in the picture than, <laughs> than my privacy was invaded. But that's okay. But you have to be an open book if you're in the entertainment world, or else you're going to, like, somebody's going to come zoom you from out of the blue. So... You're looking for a publicist, which I might be able to hook you up with that. But tell me, when you're in this business, especially in Los Angeles, because it's not New York where you can walk around and you can do this, that, and the other, to venture out to do things is a huge ordeal because it's going to take you know, two hours to get to your red carpet event, two hours to go see a manager, two hours to see an, an agent. Do you have a literary agent in New York and a literary agent in New, in L.A., or, or do you share one, Or and do you have a manager that manages your career? Uh, for an author, uh, you're going to have, you'll have one literary agent, uh, one good literary agent, one good publicist, and you should be very strong at that point. Uh, a manager uh, will come into play if uh, you start getting a little bit more into the film industry, which I think is, like you said before, is all of our objectives. Mm -hmm. It's so funny that you want to that you want to do that because let me ask you this: the other books that you're thinking about are they thrillers or are they like um, biographies or are they historical events or are they scary? I mean. Can, I'm, you're not telling us what it is, but you're giving us advice. No, I'm happy to share. Uh, it, they're, they're all thrillers. Very exciting. Uh, my, my work appeals to both female, male, uh, young and old. It's exciting. There's romance. There's action. It's funny. Um, I, I've actually had several of my female readers contact me and say, how come I don't? emphasize there's more romance in my books. And I never really thought about it that way, but I guess there is. Oh, there's some romance. I love that. Tell <laughs> me this. Um, when you were growing up, did you read a lot? Yes. I always had a book in my hand. Always. I, would, I, was, I had a library card. Kids today don't know what that is. Um, wherever we moved to as a family growing up, one of the first things my mother did was take me down to the local library, and I got my library card, and I was very proud of that library card. Oh, you're so cute. Um, what was your favorite genre? Obviously, you're into thrillers. Is there any other kind of, like, um, I love no, no, was, You know, growing up, science fiction was always fun. Um, you know, fantasy as a child growing up, imagining in different uh, worlds and one programs on track is always is always fun. Okay, now we're shifting gears again. So you've moved to LA. I'm not going to say where, but I, he told me where he was because I was telling him where to go eat. Um, what what are you spending your day? So now you've got like quite a bit of a time. Are you are or are you because you are in LA and that is such a big place to have photography done? Are you going to try and just focus in on your writing, or are you going to try and you know maybe pair off and do a little part time work? Is that or, or have you just become now? I'm just Jerry, the author. I'm no longer a photographer. You know, I'm, I'm starting to get a little scared over here, Lauren. It's like you're looking over my shoulder right now. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm literally testing some new lighting equipment as we speak. I can't believe That's you. what you meant when you said uh, I'm at lights. Yes. I'm and you don't know how bad I need a headshot. It's crazy. Like, I'm up for a roll, and they were like, can you give me a headshot? And I'm like, oh, my God. And the cutest girl that I want to do it with is all the way in Mobile. And I'm like, oh, my God. Because in L.A., you could just, like, you know, next day. All right, can That's I tell that. you a funny story about photography? Yes. Um, well, of course, because I'm the host, you have to say yes. Yes, But um, when my daughter was acting, um, some of y'all are not going to believe me, and that's okay. You can turn me off if you don't. But she went to go get headshots and never took a bad picture. But for some reason, the kid never took a bad picture. But we would go, and there would always be on the side of her shoulder, there would be like this bright, bulbish thing on the side and so they would always adjust it I mean this were different photographers we'd adjust it and do another thing and then we went to this other one um, I will tell you her name because she's a great photographer in LA um, that all the agents send you to she was taking a picture and she goes well can you move in over there mom so I moved over there and had my picture and there was nothing there and then we put her back and she goes well we can't take we're gonna have to blotch out her guardian angel I said what are you talking about she goes that's like our guardian angel over the shoulder because every picture had this little white, like shiny thing on the side of her. But then you would put me in there or my son, my poor son didn't have a guardian angel, put him over there. <laughs> there was nothing. Put her over there. There was always this bright thing with her. And I said, well, that's just because she has that it factor because you do, right, Jerry? There are people that you've, I'm sure you've taken photographs for that have an it factor yeah. And you just know that they're going to do it. It's, it's, it's really, a, a, I've been shooting for over 15 years. So, you know, that's what, you know, when you're in New York City, you're shooting just a, a phenomenal uh, array of people from all over the world. I mean, I've, I've shot so many different nationalities. You can tell just looking at someone how they're going to shoot. Uh, there is an it factor. And it, it is not so much outside. It, you can, it, it really comes from the inside. It, it sounds corny, I oh, know, yes. but it's true. Um, yeah, because people, think, you don't have to be mean to to make it. It's just oh, an oh. it factor. No. My funny story that I always say about uh, Courtney, and she ever listens to my show. I mean, I texted her the other day because I found a Thanksgiving picture of us. She, no, she never listens to my show. But the funny thing is, is that she was so beautiful. Everybody was always like spitting fire and, and you know, was kind of ugly. And I was always very protective of her because I just don't like people being bullied. And um, and I was athletic, so nobody was really going to mess with me. Um but she had that it factor. I mean, immediately she was one of those Courtney Cox. The one minute you saw her, you just knew she had it. It didn't matter if you woke her up or, you know, if we were up all night. I remember one night we had to stay up all night doing a, uh, a project for a speech and presentation. And she was up all night. She just, she has an it factor. And I always wondered if photographers are taking pictures of these people that want to be these famous you know, talents and, you know, they have these images of being Marilyn Monroe or, you know, I don't know, these images of what Hollywood is and if the photographer looking on sees it or he doesn't see it. 100%. Uh, it's a 100%. And I, I really try and, you know, when I shoot with someone, I really like to try and connect and have a certain chemistry and, and I try and guide them as much as I can during the shoot and uh, pull out of them really what's inside of them, that natural beauty, what makes them unique, rather than what they think they're, they want to elude and, and portray. Um, they'll always, you'll always give a much better and, and more powerful image uh, by being yourself and just letting it come out. Uh, I see it every day. And it's not always the most beautiful people I, uh, you know everybody wants to have like the blonde hair the blue eyed or the the big lips or the you know the curly hair it's really I don't think that to me I always say I don't fit anybody's fashion or frame I just do it what I feel comfortable in and that's how I'm happy um, but it's really what you're saying it's really what's within it's not 100% the outside. 100% you'll, you'll, you'll see the most iconic 
uh, images, whether it's Helmut Newton or, or Penn or, or you know, from, from whichever uh, iconic photographer. And the models they use are attractive, yes, but they have that, what you said, that it factor. It's not just this blatant beauty. It's, it's a uniqueness. And, and that's what every photographer wants. That's who we want to work with. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you ever had a, uh, someone you've worked with that you've kind of been like, mm, maybe, mm, it's not going to work? <laughs> yes. And, and, and it was um, at the very beginning of my career. And I was shooting with a very famous uh, photographer. We were shoulder to shoulder we were on this, this assignment. And we both uh, broke, and uh, I'm the new kid, and uh, you know he's been around and he shoots celebrities, and I was in awe of him, frankly. And uh, he said, "How's it going?" I said, "Oh my gosh!" I said, "This model just isn't giving me what I want, and and I'm trying everything I can, and she just doesn't have it." And you know, and I I went on and on and on, and he looked at me and he says, "Well, I think I know what what the problem is." And I said, oh, great. Hey, I said, wake up. tell me who it is. And he said, do you see her as beautiful as she really is? And I got to tell you, it floored me because I didn't until that moment. And that's when I recognized as a photographer, I wasn't seeing her as beautifully as I should have. And from that moment on, the shoot just off we've got some great stuff so it's really about how you see someone connecting with them and looking beyond what's on the outside it was a very very important lesson at the beginning of my career and i, and I would say and i'm like because you know i'm all into this part is that okay i see it um i'm all into this is that you know we all want to be beautiful and we always laugh at me because i'm always you know trying to give you all beauty tips and fashion tips or whatever. But eventually your beauty is going to fade and you've got to have some substance to you. So what I've always told people is beauty fades and personality and everything else uh, stays around. So you really need to work on your personality and your smarts and your humor because once you, you know, can't walk the the walk with, you know, tight booty pants on and some pumps on, you you got to have something to talk about. <laughs> Not just that, but that's who do you think us photographers keep calling back for work? We call back the, the models who have the substance, who we want to work with, who are nice and pleasant, and, and, and who show up on time, they're professional, but they have that substance, and they're nice. Yes, because being nice people in this business is very, it's difficult. And sometimes I may seem like I'm not on board, but my producer just comes in and out, in and out. I never know when he's hey, going to show up. Well. Okay, so listen, Jerry, we've got five minutes till I have to go with you. I want you to be able to tell me where, um, so our listeners, I want you to tell them everything that you want to tell them in the next three minutes. One to 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, really. Give me 10 seconds. 30 seconds. Uh, the Nighthawk Deception is available online at Amazon, iBooks, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads. It's a great adventure, super summer reading, uh, really fantastic. Men, women, all genres. Uh, you'll love it. Uh, right. A real exciting adventure. All right, Jerry, I will text you later. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome to Staying with Cosmopolitans with Lauren. You're always here to learn something new and exciting with me. Um, some things that people, we just want to know how to be models. We just want to know how to be writers. We just want to know how to be businessmen. We just want to just relax one day and laugh. That's what this show is about, sitting down with your friend, having a drink, and learning about life. And that's what I'm here for. I hope you've enjoyed Cosmopolitans.